I was, I was in FIBA coaching the, the Welsh team. And as you know, we, yeah. we, we got beat quite a lot, which, which is okay because we're a fairly new team. And out the blue, I received this fantastic invitation um, from Coach Romero. Um, would your girls like to, to join our practice? And what people don't know is when you're in FIBA, you only get a 40-minute practice. And yep. that is, that's your practice for the day. And you went out of your way to invite the Welsh team down, which, which has given me goosebumps still to this day. Um, I never actually asked you why. Uh, so, so I'm putting you on the spot. I'd like to, to ask you why. <laughs> well, <laughs> different things. And there were different reasons there. Um, we never saw the FIBA European Championships as a tour of force. or We were not there to battle against everyone. Uh, it doesn't make sense. I know they are proud to represent their country, but um, for me and for our coaching staff, that was uh, an extension of our learning curve for us and for the players. So with Dave Evans, obviously you know Dave Evans yeah. also, we were thinking about, well, what's the point of keeping all our secrets in our practice, in our practice time in these 40 minutes? We have a 45 minutes. Like, What's the point? Because as you know, in FIBA, it's totally forbidden that another team or another coach or another team manager is able to watch your practice session. Yeah. So we had nothing to hide there. As you know, in our practice sessions, we have nothing extremely tactical, basically at the 60 level, obviously. Not if we talk about pro, WBBL or something like that, I understand. But at the 60 level, is what is the point, actually, of having secrets here? Because all we do is 1v1 and improving the players huh? and give freedom to the players. So there's nothing to hide, actually. So uh, Dave and myself, we thought like, well, wait a minute. Obviously, the main link with uh, Scotland with the rest of the teams was Wales, obviously. Like, they have a lot of things in common, let me say that. And obviously, your coaching staff was amazing with us from the very first minute. We were seriously, we were seriously talking and chatting and really happy together. So. We thought, why not? So we invite you to do this and to have actually a common practice session that maybe it will not help to win the next day game. It's not important at that point. It wasn't important at that point, let's be honest. But that will be a, a, actually a friendship, a, a connection, player with players, coaches with coaches, and that was the main goal for us in that European Championships. So we did it. As you can imagine, we had some problems with FIBA. <laughs> Serious problems with FIBA. FIBA, we are not mm, happy with that. But obviously, we did it. And I think it was amazing. I think it was amazing. I agree. Yeah. I think it's one of the best, one of the most memorable moments. Uh, and next year will be 30 years coaching uh, for me. It was most, one of the most memorable moments that I've ever had. Uh, to see the, the fun that... I, I make sure it's in my philosophy, the fun that you had and yep. put into the girls, absolutely fantastic. Tina, you share a very similar, no, a similar uh, thought process around, around the game, which is, which is I find quite rare in different parts of, of especially the UK. Do you want to sort of talk about what your thoughts are on, we've, we've coached uh, Wales, this is um, Scotland also, and, you know, we came across, we did some video analysis. Do you want to share your thoughts behind that? Yeah, um, I mean, similar to Luis, really. Um, basketball, it isn't really a very complicated game. And um, <laughs> but I think sometimes coaches overcomplicate it. And um, so, yeah, there's no real secrets as such. So the, so the more that we can collaborate um, to develop the game um, holistically, um, you know, across the world is is um, for, for the best, I think. Um, I mean, I had the opportunity um, as a young player um, growing up in running basketball, and I, and um, it enhanced me not just as a, as a basketball, but as a person as well. And so that that's very something that drives my personal philosophy is that um, really what as coaches we should be doing is seeing how we can. Um, develop people through basketball 
um, so on court and off court. So that's something that very much kind of drives my philosophy um, in the sport. And um, as you know, um, Lee, um, certainly when I do any tutoring, that, that kind of comes across. Um, within. Oh, 100%. Now there's something, uh, as I said, I've done my homework. There's something that's come across <laughs> from, from both of you. Um, and that is you're both uh, performance coaches. But um, Luis, one of the, to quote one of the um, comments, uh, somebody up in Scotland, I don't want to mention too many names, but somebody says that uh, Luis Romero is, is the key driver uh, of growing grassroots sport up in Scotland uh, when you had your time. And I thought that was a fantastic comment in the running game. And Tina, the same goes um, in, the, in the wheelchair game. So for me, you are very few coaches who believe that grassroots is just as important, uh, as, important as performance. Is that something that, that you both want to talk about? Luis, I know your strong thoughts on that. No, for me, for me, um, for me grassroots are more important than the pro team. I have no doubt about this. Um, and I think it's quite obvious. If you don't have grassroots, you will never have a pro team. And I know, obviously, pro team sells a lot of t-shirts and on TV and all this stuff. Um, but the main point of having that pro team finally is to promote basketball. It's actually to promote basketball, and that's the only way we will grow the sport, right? And um, I think we will. We can never forget is maybe we start with I don't know. 300, 400, under 10 teams in the whole country. Uh, we, we were not able to have 400 under 10 teams in Scotland years ago. Maybe now they are. I, I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers now in, in Scotland. But um, after that, maybe only, I don't know, maybe only one will be, one, one player will be professional player, maybe. Maybe 100 of them will be finally playing in the National League, in the Scottish National League. Amazing. And the other 300, well, the other 300 can play just for fun. The other 300 will have kids, and those kids, the son, the daughter, will play basketball also. The other 300 will be also our referees, will be also our table officials, will be people who will be promoting sport, will be healthy people, and maybe will be the sponsors of a team when they grow up. I don't know, right? Or maybe they will study law, and they will specialize in sporting laws and they will keep 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 your contract right if you are a professional team. So everything will be expanding after that. This is the key. So the more people we have at the 10 level, the better society we will have. Plus, we can never forget uh, probably every pound you spend in under 10 sport is a pound you will save for your NHS in the future. Yes, because people will be better. This is this just so obvious. Plus, people will be happy when they play sport. I think this is something we can never forget. And now, if we are a little bit uh, arrogant or egoist, okay, the more people we have at, at, at the 10 level, the best teams seniors we will have in the future. Obviously, that's, that's probably that's something that the national government body should think about. But definitely, every single pound we spend in, in, that, in grassroots, it will help in the future. No doubt. And, and Tina, you were instrumental, if, if I've got my facts cor correct, in starting up the Sheffield junior team um, when you were in u university or finished university. Am I, do you want to talk mm -hmm. a bit about that? Because you've done so much for, for junior sports and grassroots sports. Can you sort of talk to everybody a bit about that? Oh gosh, you're, test you're testing my memory now. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, back in, I guess it was around about um, 1991. Uh, so I was, I was playing um, the Sheffield Hatters um, in, uh, in Sheffield at the time and doing quite a lot of coaching for their um, junior squads there. So I've, I've always coached um, juniors in running basketball, um, ma mainly women, but um, mainly girls, but, but sometimes lads as well. And um, I was studying at um, Sheffield City Poly, which is now Hallam University, and um, a poor student. And uh, within our club, uh, we had um, the Hatters, the Forgers, which went on to be um, Sheffield Sharks, and also Sheffield Steelers, which was one of the best um, wheelchair basketball um, 
teams in uh, in the United Kingdom, actually in Europe as well. And uh, they got some funding and some development. And uh, they didn't really have that many juniors, if any juniors, uh, in in the team. Um, so they so part of this funding was to go into schools and raise the profile um, in readiness for um, a European qualifier that they were having, but also to try and get some junior players in uh, involved in the sport. And um, none of the coaches really had any experience of uh, coaching juniors. Um, so they knew I had, but I didn't have any experience with coaching anybody with a disability. So I went to some schools and uh, coached, um, well, took, took some of the players with me. And it just snowballed from there. So to start with, we had five coaches and one junior player. And that was uh, the case for about three weeks, four weeks. We gradually um, got more players. Uh, Jonathan Hall, which uh, Lee, you might remember, um, was one of the you know the GB players. He was one of our first juniors, and honestly, I had absolutely no clue about coaching wheelchair basketball. Um, a lot of it was just trial and error. And what I um, what I did was just ask the players. I asked the kids, "What can you do?" Um, I never demonstrated in in a chair because I wasn't that good in a chair. Um, I used to do foot fakes, um, little little moves that I do in kind of running basketball. Um, two ball dribbling I said can you do it you know is it possible I didn't even know it was possible to do two ball dribbling in a wheelchair um, Jonathan Hall showed me that you could actually do three ball dribbling in a wheelchair <laughs> so, <laughs> so he, he was very much um, somebody that that I guess allowed me to see that um, anything that I do in running th running basketball is possible um, in wheelchair basketball and he honestly helped me transform my coaching um, from then on I thought right well I've I've had the opportunity to represent my school represent my university um, play local league play um, you know represent Great Britain at different games do all of that any kid who's got a disability should be able to do the same as me so um, that's when I kind of went on a little bit of a mission um, to uh, make sure we had um, junior development um, you know, a little bit later on, um, inclusive zone basketball. So that's something that the kids could do in the school. Uh, so yeah, so it was it was that early experience that um, showed me that anything's possible um, in, in you know in wheelchair basketball. So yeah, that's that kind of drove me. And and you ended up marrying um, one of the greatest wheelchair basketball players of all time. Luis, no. you need no. to tell the story because no. No. every time no. I hear it, it just, it just. No, no, no! Please. I hate, I hate, I hate that man. No, I hate that man. No, 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 no. Well, no, tell, I mean, I mean, story, okay, I'm, 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 no, I'm, I don't know the exact story, but uh, okay. So anyway, at <laughs> 1992 Olympics, uh, I was, I was there, a volunteer. And obviously in the Paralympics also, I was watching all the games, yeah? Uh, and, and Spain Spain had a really good team, a decent team, okay, for us. Uh, but <laughs> we played twice against the GB team. And there was always a man there, like, killed us, like, non-stop in both games. It was, he was unstoppable. I actually had ah, nightmares with that man. I hated that man so much, like, seriously so much i was 20 years old oh my god oh my god i hated that much that, that, that oh that meant so much like for years and years and then i forgot it and then i forgot about him and then talking about him when tina gordon joined there the basketball scotland office and i was talking oh okay oh amazing wheelchair blah 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 and obviously my first conversation was oh man the first thing I remember about wheelchair was that man i hate that man <laughs> that gordon oh man Seriously, he killed us twice in the Olympics, and, blah, 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 and suddenly, yeah, he was. <laughs> it was him. Yeah, it was him. I didn't know what to do. Seriously, I wanted to to run away. Like, uh, oh shit! Did I say something bad? Actually, yeah. I, oh, yeah, it was him. And 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 even 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 when 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 <laughs> when she introduced me to him, I was so nervous. It was like <laughs> seriously. It was like for me. I, I'm not even joking. Because unfortunately, I'm not. Ex I wasn't extremely linked with wheelchair basketball. It was like like meeting Michael Jordan, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not lying to you. 
<laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's him. Yeah, it's him. Of course, it's him. Like, hi, how are you? I was like, oh, I was nervous, shaking, like, <laughs> seriously. And then we had a beer together. I remember we went out and, and then it's like, oh my God, I'm actually having a beer with Michael Jordan. Like, <laughs> for me, it was the wheelchair Michael Jordan. I couldn't believe it, but I'm sure, he ne she never told me, but I'm sure I said some rude words about him before knowing. Yeah, it was, you were the wife. <laughs> yeah. Every time I hear that story, it's just... Um, That's just, totally real. Yeah. That's totally real, Tina, because I, I, never, I never listened to that part of the story under your point of view. <laughs> well, maybe it's quite fun. Yeah, actually. <laughs> I, I, I just want to tell a little bit of a story, uh, something Tina touched on. Uh, I went to a, um, a Masters wheelchair basketball tournament when I first got into wheelchair basketball. And I was invited over by uh, Colin Price and, and I turned up there in my little yellow wheelchair, you know, really low and I'm pushing around and this massive guy comes on and starts putting the ball around his back and around his head and <laughs> everything you would do in the running game. And I'm like, exactly the same as you. I was like, wow, that's Mr. Gordon. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Tina, um, I'm, I'm conscious that we're on Zoom, you have 40 minutes. You are one of the founders of Inclusive Zone Basketball. Mm -hmm. I embrace. We love it. Every school in our county has wheelchairs now. They can all take part. Do you want to briefly tell people your, how it all came about and um, what inclusive basketball means to you and, and to everybody who plays the game? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was very much kind of um, born out of um, necessity, I guess, <laughs> the time in Sheffield. Um, I guess I guess it was kind of around about 2002, 2003. Um, I went on a top sports ability um, training course, and um, we did a whole bunch of things like table cricket and how to adapt sports. And one of the sports was um, uh, zone hockey, and uh, and we were playing this. And I thought we can do this for basketball. In fact, it'll work really well for basketball. So. Um, at the, at the time, we were doing a bit of a, a schools program, and we didn't have the um, the number of, of sports wheelchairs to you know to, to kind of have five v five games. So we were doing something that was like four v four, and a lot of the schools were saying, "Well, we we can't afford um, wheelchairs." So myself and um, Lorraine Gale, who was the um, basketball development officer and a teammate of mine at Hatters. Um, she she did the Hot Shots program, which was 4v4, this is running basketball, um, two girls and two boys um, on the court. And I said, well, why don't we look at inclusive zone basketball, we'll, we'll call it that, and we'll have two um, wheelchair users and two runners, and, and we'll do a schools competition. And she said, yeah, fine, we'll, we'll fund that. So we tried it within Sheffield. And it was an opportunity for us to... Um, I guess the, the kids that we had in the team, they, a lot of them were excluded from PE um, at the time. And, the, and, it, and it wasn't an, they didn't have an opportunity to showcase how good they were, especially in a team sport. So, so that was a chance for them to do that. And also um, for some of them to do um, GCSE PE and actually get kind of graded on, um, on a team sport. Um, so we kind of put rules in there that, well, as long as you've got one player that's got a disability on your team, then the able-bodied players can just go in and out of the chair. And then that very much looks at inclusion. So, so we looked at different ways that we could configure the court and we came up with the diamond um, idea. Initially, we just put lateral lines with it and it worked. Then in 2006, I think it was, um, I was speaking to Char Charlie Bethel, who was the CEO at British Wheelchair Basketball at the time, and um, looked at um, putting together the, the Leader Award. So I wrote the Leader Award um, and the Skills Awards that went along with it, and we put Inclusive Zone Basketball um, in there. Um, then once I became um, Junior Development Officer, um, it was a chance to kind of develop it a little bit more. So at the time, we were just looking at um, Sheffield schools. Then we went South Yorkshire and Yorkshire wide um, with, with that. And Steve Greterex very much took it under his wing and um, was developing it in um and the rest of Yorkshire really. Um, then the Youth Sport Trust um, supported British Wheelchair Basketball in developing it um, even further. So, uh, so a programme was kind of put together. Um, Robbie David Critwell then um, looked at 
that on um, on even more, and it kind of grew from that. So so yeah, I mean, ironically, um, something that initially started in in Sheffield, um, we don't really have in Scotland. So um, this this year uh, we were going to kind of develop it a little bit more and starting to develop it in schools, but obviously now we've got the lockdown and so we're we're going to be starting again. Um, so I feel like I'm always going back to square one in trying to develop it. So so I'm thrilled at what you're doing, Lee, um, in uh, you know in Aberystwyth and, and the rest of Wales uh, with it. it. You know, it very much uh, makes my heart sing to see how um, either be developed. Yeah, it's really been um, embraced by the by everybody, especially in our county. Kerry mm -hmm. Diglion, the, the the development officer, has been fantastic in in sourcing the funding for the chairs, which was you know instrumental. So every school has has wheelchairs. Uh, but I want to say thank you because IZB has been, I think, fantastic for for the country and a, a brilliant invention. Um, mm -hmm. I'm conscious. Well, I saw, of, so I, I saw the idea from, from Zone Hockey um, with the um, you know with the with the, um, the inventor of Zone Hockey with, with his blessing. Um, so so yeah, I mean, and you brought it to life. So uh, so that's great. Thank you, Tina. I'm conscious of we've only got 40 minutes on Zoom, so I ask everybody a couple of questions. Tina, most memorable moment in your basketball career ever. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Tough one. Um, oh God! Yeah, one. So many. I mean, I've had great ones with um, the GB women. I, I suppose, um, I suppose when I'm going to say junior in junior basketball, um, the school games when Scotland um, first got into a uh, medal position um, uh, back in oh, when was it? Uh, 2017, I think it was. Yeah, um, yeah. So that was the first time that we we actually got into a position that um, you know that we could could medal. But there's there's so many brilliant moments. Um, mostly seeing people flourish with, with within the within the sport. Luis, wow, each and every one. One, one, pick one. <laughs> one um, um well uh, we in 2012 i think 2011 or 2012 i don't remember um we created for the first time the under 12 scotland national team there has been never an under 12 proper national team and uh, we went to godberg we went to sweden and we went there to play a tournament as a scottish national team uh the first game we got thumped as you can imagine but just that feeling of someone like, like, like ball there and it was the first ever under 12 national team so that means grassroots were really growing up and finally we have a representation for the full country playing up road for me that was the best moment yeah i, I want to talk quickly um about a very special moment i had earlier this year where i coached my first special olympics team mm -hmm. and um we had the gold medal I've, I've never had, I've had bronze, I've had silver in wheelchair running, never had a gold. And for me to see those guys, uh, the, the look on their face was just, um, you both said the same thing. Um, last thing, but the last dance, have you watched it, Luis, Tina? Yeah. I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it, yep. Who, in your humble opinion, is the greatest player of all time? <laughs> Yeah. Um, I, uh, this is definitely showing my age. Um, I have always been a fan of uh, Larry Bird. Um, I like, I love his style. I love his, um, you know, well, just, I, I just, yeah. So that's, so that's showing my age a little bit. But I'm still <laughs> great player, great player. Luis? Uh, for me, it's a Spanish player, but uh, if we see it globally, for me, should be Magic Johnson um, oh. because of the style of play, just for the creativity. Uh, for me, as you know perfectly, Lee, we push our creativity to the limit. Oh, and yeah. We don't care if there is a lot of turnovers or whatever, but we need to push the creativity of the players. And if you think carefully, probably it hasn't been any other more creative than Magic. Great. Um, for me, Michael Jordan, because I grew up with watching him, he was sort of my, everybody wanted to be like Mike, so... So for yep. me, 
Um, stay on the line. I want to thank you both very much. Um, I'm going to put this video up. I think it'll be great for coaches, players, and everybody to listen. Thank you both very much. Stay on the line, um, and I'll speak to you in a minute. Thank you both. Thank you.